Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is podcast episode 132, week 18 of the Drums of Autumn Read Along. I am so happy to be here with you today. I happen to really, really love the chapter we're doing, and I had forgotten about some of the detail that was in here, even though I've read this book multiple times, going through it line by line in preparation for the podcast is always eye-opening for me. I'm shocked by how many little nuances that I've missed in the past or just overlooked because I was reading for the main story. And I think that is really what is so exciting about a podcast read-along is that you have to slow down, you need to pause, and you need to really look at the material with the microscope if you want to, right? Because it gives you the opportunity to allow the story to breathe and to really look at it in a different way. It's almost more conversational because of the speed. It just, it really takes its own time then. At least that's how I look at it. And then you can absorb the small details. What is going on in nature? Is a character emulating or mimicking another character? What literary devices are at play? And you don't have to be an English lit major to be able to do that. The other part that I really enjoy, and because I love history so much, is being able to challenge yourself to look at the material, especially when the material is challenging, to look at it through the cultural lens of the time that you're reading. I think this is one of the things in the Christian church that is really challenging, is that the material is totally taken out of context. And we try to just directly apply it to 21st century or when we have to really figure out who's being spoken to, what is the culture of the time, you have to really step back and look at the laws, the rules, the mores in order to understand it. And the Bible is the most read book in the world. And I don't think people look at it through the historical lens whatsoever, and to understand the meaning behind it, and then to apply it to their own lives. So I think Outlander is the same thing. Any period piece that you're going through, I think it is vital to be able to take off your 20th and 21st century hats. Because, okay, anyway, that's just a little bit of my thought process. And I did a little tweet fest this week, a couple of days ago, I think, maybe yesterday, about living in the 18th century. My biggest hang-up wouldn't be lack of surgery or drugs, pharmaceuticals, particularly antibiotics, and I'll tell you why in a moment, or living rough without flushing water or toilets or showers where you have to heat everything and get make everything from scratch or buy it from someone. My biggest issue, depending on the part of the world, is how women were treated and that women legally are objects, they're property, and that women did not have full legal investment. They couldn't necessarily, in all places, give testimony as a whole person, say. (laughs) Couldn't vote. Obviously, we know that. And a lot of women didn't want to vote, which is hilarious to me. I have no understanding of that. It's something I need to research. But women were considered their father's property, and if not their father, their closest male relative, and then their spouses. That is beyond... But part of that that's so insidious is that women were not safe at all. You had to be chaperoned, or you could be attacked, assaulted, raped. 
And that's one of the criticisms that Diana Gabaldon gets under for her books that there's rapes. Guess what? The 18th century was a dangerous freaking place. People got raped. Yep. There were a lot of abuses going on, and we like to think now is kinder and gentler. It is in some ways, but it still happens all the time. Women are still more vulnerable than men, especially women who are pregnant or have small children. So, yes, some things have really progressed, and we actually can have our own credit and things like that, but it was a place where you would have to have some fear of men. And in my 20th and 21st century upbringing, I have very little fear of men. I so understand Claire just saying what she wants to say. And she was a 1940s woman, but she had been through the war. And that really changed her too. And she was with the men all the time. So she really lost even the fear of the time. And she's very outspoken. And she grew up with an uncle traveling. So her experience was not the usual. And I don't want that fear. I don't want to have to question men's motivations. But that's the part of the 18th century that is really terrible to me. It isn't easy. And we're going to see in this book just how difficult some of those social mores are and how lightly certain situations are treated. Yep, we're going to see them. So we are going to do chapter 34, and it's Lallybrach. And there is a very lengthy letter from Jamie, and I plan on reading the letter in its entirety because I think it needs to be read in its entirety because it really gives the perspective of what's going on at Fraser's Ridge to somebody who's not there. Scotland, June 1769. Brianna is on horseback. Brutus is his name. He flawlessly, if not swiftly, has carried her on General Wade's old military roads, the bad roads, and the red deer track trails on her way to Lallybrach. She looks over the valley below and sees it. It matches the description her mother told her down to the kale yard. Rising smoke from the chimney indicates someone is home. She is nervous and excited. Who would she meet first? Will they believe her story of who she was and why she had come? Her story was based on as much truth as possible. She brought evidence with her. They would have to believe her. Could her parents be there right now? A horse carrying a tall, brown-haired man approaches her from behind. He was wary of her until he got close enough to realize she was a woman. She's a big woman and looks like a man from a distance. This is to her advantage when she's traveling alone. She tells the man her name. He's puzzled and shares his with her, Jamie Fraser Murray of Brock Turhawk. Young Jamie! My family calls me so. Pleased to meet you. I'm your cousin. The brows which had come down during the introductions popped back up. He looked at her extended hand, then incredulously at her face. Jamie Fraser is my father. His jaw dropped, and he simply goggled at her for a moment. He looked her over minutely, head to toe, peered closely at her face, and then a wide, slow smile spread across his own. Damned if he isn't. Christ, you've the look of him. He laughed, humor transforming his face. Jesus, my mother will have kittens. His reaction is perfect. Jenny is going to birth some form of an animal, to be sure. <laughs> Brianna notices the carved lintel over the door. Fraser, 1716, it said. She instinctively ducks while going through the door. 
were mostly tall, save my mam and wee kitty. But a grandsire, your grandsire, too, built this house for his wife, who was a very tall woman herself. It's the only house in the Highlands where you can go through a doorway without ducking or bashing your head, I expect. She's been traveling in the Highlands for a little while, and the places she's been to would certainly have lower doorways that she would have to be careful of. She thinks how little family she has in the 20th century, a lone distance cousin of her dad, Frank. Here she will have a large family connected to her. Jamie's son, Matthew, goes running past being chased by his sister, Janet. The boy, Matthew, comments on Brianna's choice of clothing. Da, is that a lady? Of course she is. I've told you, she's her cousin. But she's got on breeks. Ladies didn't wear breeks. The young woman looked rather as though she subscribed to this opinion as well, but she interrupted firmly, moving to take the little boy from his father. Well, and I'm sure she's a fine reason for it, but it isn't proper to be making remarks before people's faces. You go and get yourself washed, I. She set him down and turned him toward the door at the end of the hallway, giving him a gentle push. He didn't move, but turned back around to stare at Brianna. Matthew discloses Jenny and Ian are in the back parlor with a man and a woman who are eating a large amount of food. Jamie sends the boy to get his granny. Jamie tries to get Janet to guess who Brianna is related to. She figures it out with great surprise. Enter Jenny Murray. Jenny Murray was very small, no more than five feet tall, and delicately boned as a sparrow. She stood staring at Brianna, mouth slightly open. Her eyes were the deep blue of gentians, made the more striking by a face gone white as paper. Oh, my, she said softly. Oh, my. Brianna smiled tentatively, nodding to her aunt, her mother's friend, her father's beloved only sister. Oh, please, she thought, suddenly suffused with a longing as intense as it was unexpected. Please like me. Please be happy I'm here. Just as young Jamie is introducing Brianna, the woman from the parlor joins the group. Jamie Fraser, I can't he was back. I told you, Jenny Murray. The voice rang out from the back of the hallway in tones of high-pitched accusation. Glancing up in startlement, Brianna saw a woman emerging from the shadows, rustling with indignation. Am I as Ketrick told me he'd seen your brother ride near Bell Riggin? But no, you wouldn't have it, would you, Jenny? Telling me I'm a fool, telling me Amias is blind, and Jamie in America. Liars, the both of you, you and Ian, trying to protect that wicked coward. Hobart, she shouted, turning toward the back of the house. Hobart, come out here this minute. Jenny admonishes Leary for her foolishness and tells her this is a lass, not a man. Leary looks at Brianna for the first time. Mary, Margaret, and Bright, who in the name of God are you? Brianna took a deep breath, looking from one woman to the other as she answered, trying to keep her voice from shaking. My name is Brianna. I'm Jamie Fraser's daughter. Both women's eyes popped wide. The woman called Leary grew slowly red and seemed to swell, opening and closing her mouth in a futile search for words. Jamie's, you're truly Jamie's lassie. My mother says so. <laughs> that was Jenny talking to Brianna. Does she so? Leary had recovered both her voice and her self-possession. She stepped forward, eyes narrowed. Jimmy Fraser's your father, eh? And just who might your mother be? His wife. Who else? Leary put back her head and laughed. It wasn't a nice laugh. Who else? Who else indeed, lassie? And just which wife would that be now? The realization Jamie Fraser could have married again chills Brianna to the bone. She thinks of her mother and is horrified she could have found Jamie with another wife when she went through the stones. She wants 
to run out of the house and keep on running. She is like her mother in some ways, isn't she? Young Jamie steers her to a place to sit. In the room, she sees two men. One asks her name. It's Ian Murray, her uncle. She feels safer in his presence until Leary comes in, havering up to high heaven. She says she's your niece. Be like she's only come to see what she can get. I should not be calling the kettle black, Leary. Or was it not you and Hobart a half hour past trying to squeeze five hundred pounds from me? Her lips pressed together, deepening the lines that bracketed her mouth. That money's mine, and will you know it? It was agreed to. You witnessed the paper. Ian sighed. Evidently, this wasn't the first he had heard of the matter today. I did, and you'll have your money soon as Jamie's able to send it. He's promised, and he's an honorable man. But honorable is it? Leary produced an unladylike snort. Is it honorable to commit bigamy then? Desert his wife and children, steal away my daughter and ruin her. Honorable. She looked at Brianna, eyes bright and hard as fresh rolled steel. I'll ask again, lass. What's your mother's name? Brianna simply stared at her, overwhelmed. The stalk around her throat was choking her, and her hands felt icy despite Ian's grasp. Your mother? Who was she? It does not matter who, Jenny began, but Leary rounded on her face, flushed with fury. Oh, it matters. If he got her on some army whore or some slut of a maidservant when he was in England, that's one thing. But if she's... Leary! Sister! You foul-tongued bosom! Brianna put a stop to the outcry simply by standing up. She was as tall as any of the men and towered over the women. Leary took one quick step back. Every face in the room was turned to her, marked with hostility, sympathy, or merely curiosity. With a coolness that she didn't feel, Brianna reached for the inner pocket of her coat, the secret pocket she had sewed into the seam only a week before. It seemed like a century. My mother's name is Claire, she said, and dropped the necklace on the table. Oh, my, Jenny said softly. She lifted her head and looked Brianna in the face, the slanted blue eyes shimmering with what looked like tears. I'm so very glad to see you, niece. I need a dram or two after this scene. <laughs> and it's only going to continue to build. Like, we are just climbing this storyline. The tension is not done yet. <laughs> We're not quite down. Brianna asks after her mother. Ian assures Brianna that Claire is with Jamie. Leary cannot help herself. She says the pearls are hers by right. That they are not, said Jenny with a quick flash of temper. They were my mother's jewels that my father gave to Jamie for his wife, and... And his wife I am, Leary interrupted. She looked at Brianna, then a cold, gauging look. I am his wife. I married him in good faith, and he promised me payment for the wrong he did me. She turned her cold gaze on Jenny. It's been more than a year since I've seen a penny. Am I to sell my shoes to feed my daughter? The one he's left to me? If you're his daughter, then his debts are yours as well. Tell her, Hobart. Hobart looked mildly embarrassed. Ah, ah now, sister. I dunna think. No, you don't. And you have not since you were born. She shook him off in irritation and stretched out a hand toward the pearls. They're mine. This is not the best side of Leary. Damn her eyes, <laughs> Kenzie. Brianna snatches the pearls off the table and holds them tightly. She then addresses Leary without success. Leary calls Jamie a bastard and says he married her under pretenses four years earlier. 
and she explains that Jamie left her. He said that he could not bear it longer to dwell in the same house with me to share my bed. So he left, and then he came back with the witch, flaunted her in my face, bedded her under my nose. It was she. She cast her spells on him from the day she came to Leach and on me. She made me invisible. From the day she came, he could not see me. And then she was gone, dead, they said, killed in the rising. And him come home again from England, free at long last. But she was not dead at all. And he was not free. I knew that. I always knew that. You cannot kill a witch with steel. They must burn. You saw her at my wedding. Her fetch standing there between me and him. You saw her, but you did not say. I only heard it later when you told Maisry the seer. You should have told me then. As if insulting Jamie and her mother wasn't enough, she insults Brianna, calling her a witch's child. They should have burned her mother in Cranesmere, save for the love spell she put on Jamie Fraser. I, I say, be wary of what you've brought into your house. The Fraser anger rises in Brianna, and she lets Leary have it. Hogwash. Hogwash she said again and pointed a finger at the woman. If they ought to be wary of anybody, it's you, you fucking murderess. Leary's mouth was open wider than anyone's, but no sound came out. You didn't tell them all about Cranesmere, did you? My mother should have, but she didn't. She thought you were too young to know what you were doing. You weren't, though, were you? What? said Jenny in a faint voice. She tried to kill my mother. Brianna was having trouble controlling her voice. It cracked and trembled, but she got the words out. You did, didn't you? You told her Galus Duncan was ill and calling for her. You knew she'd go. She always went to anybody sick. She's a doctor. You knew they were going to arrest Gailey Duncan for witchcraft, and if my mother was there, they'd take her too. You thought they'd burn her, and then you could have him, have Jamie Fraser." I could feel her hand on him in our bed, lying there between us, with her hand on him so he would stiffen and cry out to her in his sleep. She was a witch. I always knew. Hobart leads a stunned Leary out of the room to take her home. Leary must have the last words and leaves Brianna with a parting twist of the tongue. If you're Jamie Fraser's daughter, and you may be given your looks, know this. Your father is a liar and a whoremaster, a cheat and a pander. I wish you well of each other. I am totally in love with Brianna here. She's coming into her own as a confident woman, as a Fraser daughter. Yeah, now Jenny gets the what for. Like she now understands why Claire was completely flipped out. And Brianna says he went on loving her. He didn't forget her. Of course he didn't forget her. Neither did we, Ian said. They finish dinner with the joy of Brianna, the joy that Jamie has his child. She's thankful that Leary's accusations of Jamie were untrue. Brianna asks if they know where her mother and Jamie are. They basically do, and Ian offers to show her a letter from her parents. Following Jenny, Brianna stops and notices a portrait on the wall with her father as a child in it. And Jenny shows her a painting of her mother, Ellen. Brianna gasped when she saw it. She looks remarkably like Ellen Mackenzie. The painting will hang in the National Portrait Gallery in 200 years. It turns out that Ellen painted the portrait herself. Brianna's talent for drawing and painting comes from her grandmother. And Jenny explains how she came into possession of the painting. Ned Gowan brought it to her from Leach. Brianna feels a stab of grief for those lost. We learn that Jenny never saw Leach for herself, and now it's gone, and the inhabitants are scattered. Brianna follows Jenny into the bedroom. 
Jenny finds the letter and explains they live in the colony of North Carolina, but not near any towns. She explains it's difficult for Jamie to write since his hand was broken that time. Brianna knows the whole story behind the broken hand. Jenny does not. Looking at the letter, Brianna recognizes the writing. The letter is from the prior September. Fraser's Ridge, Monday, 19 September. My dearest Jenny, all are here in good health and spirits, and trust that this letter will find all in your household likewise content. Your son sends his most affectionate regards and begs to be remembered to his father, brothers, and sisters. He bids you tell Matthew and Henry that he sends them the enclosed object, which is the preserved skull of an animal called porpentine, by reason of its prodigious spines, though it is not at all like the small hedge creepy, which you will know by that name, being much greater in size and dwelling in the treetops, where it feasts upon the tender shoots. Tell Matthew and Henry that I do not know why the teeth are orange. No doubt the animal finds it decorative. Also enclosed, you will find a small present for yourself. The patterning is contrived by use of the quills of the same porpentine, which the Indians dye with the juices of several plants before weaving them into indigenous manner you see before you. Claire has been recently much interested by conversation, if the term can be used for communication limited mostly to gesticulations and the making of faces. She insists I note here that she does not make faces, to which I reply that I am in better case to judge of the matter, being able to see the face in question, which she is not. In conversation with an old woman of the Indians, much esteemed in this area as a healer, who has given her many such plants, in consequence her fingers are purple at present, which I find most decorative. Tuesday, 20 September I have been much occupied today in repair and strengthening of the penfold, in which we keep our few cows, pigs, etc. a night, to protect them from the depredations of bears, which are plentiful. In walking to the privy this morning, I espied a great paw print in the mud, which measured quite the length of my own foot. The stock appeared nervous and disturbed, for which condition I can scarce blame them. Do not, I pray, suffer any alarm on our account. The black bears of this country are wary of humans and loath to approach even a single man. Also, our house is strongly built, and I have forbidden Ian to go abroad after dark, save he is well armed. In the matter of armament, our situation is much improved. Fergus has brought back from High Point both a fine rifle of the new kind and several excellent knives. Also a large boiling kettle, whose acquisition we have celebrated with a great quantity of tasty stew made with venison, wild onions from the wood, dried beans, and likewise some tomato fruits, dried from the summer, None of us died or suffered ill effects from eating of the stew. So Claire is likely right. Tomatoes are not poison. <laughs> Wednesday, 21st, September. The bear has come again. I find large prints and scrapings on the new turned ground of Claire's garden today. The beast will be fattening for its winter slumbers and no doubt seeks to dig for grubs in fresh earth. I have removed the sow to her pantry since she is near farrowing. Neither Claire nor the sow was greatly pleased by this arrangement, but the animal is valuable, having cost me three pound for Mr. Quillen. Four Indians came today. They are of a kind called Tuscarora. I have met these men on several occasions and found them most amiable. The savages, having expressed a determination to hunt our particular bear, I made them a gift of some tobacco and a knife, with which they seemed pleased. They sat under the eaves of our house. They sat under the eaves of the house most of the morning, smoking and talking among themselves, but then near midday made to depart upon their hunt. I inquired whether the bear, seeming fond of our society, 
it would not be best for the hunters to lie hidden nearby, in hopes that the animal will return here. I was informed with the kindest condescension. I was informed with the kindest condescension possible through word and sign that the appearance of the animal's droppings indicated beyond any doubt that it had quitted the area and was bound upon some errand to the west. Being of no mind to take issue with such expert practitioners, I wished them luck and bade them a cordial farewell. I could not accompany them, having urgent, having urgent labours still to perform here, but Ian and Rollo have gone with them, as they have done before. I have loaded my new rifle and let it. I have loaded my new rifle and left it ready to hand, lest our friends' apprehension. As to the bearer's intent, be mistaken. Thursday, twenty two September. I was roused from sleep last night by a hideous noise. This was a great scraping which reverberated through the wooden logs of the wall, accompanied by such thumps and loud wails that I bolted from my bed, convinced that the house was like to fall about our ears. The sow observing the nearness of an enemy burst through the door of the pantry, which I will say was flimsily made, and took refuge beneath our bed, squealing in a manner to deafen us. Perceiving that the bear was at hand, I seized my new rifle and ran outside. It was a moonlit night, though hazy, and I could plainly see my adversary, a great black shape, which stretched upon its hind feet, appeared near as tall as myself, and, to my anxious eyes, roughly three times as wide, being at no great distance from me. I fired at it, whereon it dropped to all fours and ran with amazing speed toward the shelter of the nearby wood, disappearing before I could make shift to shoot any more. Come daylight, I searched the ground for sign of blood and found none, so cannot say did my shot find its target. The side of the house is decorated with several long scrapes, as might be made with a sharpened adze or chisel showing white in the wood. We have since been at some pains to persuade the sow. She is a white sow of prodigious size, a most stubborn temper, and not lacking in teeth, to quit our bed and repair to her sanctuary in the pantry. She was reluctant, but was at length persuaded by the combination of a trail of shattered corn laid before her and myself at her rear, armed with a stout broom. Monday, 26th September. Ian and his red companions have returned, their prey having eluded them in the wood. I shrewed them the scratches upon the side of the house, whereon they became excited and talked among themselves at such a rate I could not follow their words. One man then detached a large tooth from his necklace of such items and presented it to me with great ceremony, saying that it would serve to identify me in the bear spirit and thus protect me from harm. I accepted this token with all due solemnity. I was then obliged to present him with a piece of honeycomb in exchange. Thus the proprieties were observed. Claire was called to provide the honeycomb, and with her usual eye for such matters, perceived that one of her guests was unwell. Being heavy-eyed, coughing, and distracted in appearance, Claire says he also flushed with fever, though this is not obvious to look at him. He being too ill to continue with his companions, we have laid him on a pallet in the corn crib. The sow has most incontinently farrowed in the pantry. There are a dozen piglets, all healthy and of a vigorous appetite. For as God be thanked, our own appetites bid fair to be impoverished for the present, as the sow serious, viciously as the sow viciously attacks anyone who opens the door of the pantry, roaring and gnashing her teeth in rage. I was given one egg to my supper and informed that I shall get no more until I have contrived a solution to this difficulty. Saturday, 1 October. A great surprise today. Two guests have come. 
Jenny interrupts Brianna's reading to ask if she still plans on going to such a wild place and to show her the leather bag that Jamie sent. She is relieved Brianna is not afraid to go to the colonies and on to Fraser's Ridge, but she wants her to stay for a couple of days. Now alone, Brianna rereads the letter slowly, and she can almost see the man in the letter in front of her. She gets to the part she was interrupted by Jenny. Saturday, 1 October. A great surprise today. Two guests have come from Cross Creek. You will recall, I think, my telling you of Lord John Gray, whom I knew in Ardsmere. I have not said that I had seen him since in Jamaica, where he was governor for the crown. He is perhaps the last person one should expect to find in this remote place, so far removed from all traces of civilization, let alone those luxurious offices and trappings of pomp to which he is accustomed. Surely we were most astonished by his appearing at our door, though we had once made him welcome. It is a melancholy event that has led him here, I am sorry to say. His wife embarked from England with her son, contracted a fever on the voyage, and died of it while on the ocean. Fearing lest the miasmas of the tropics prove as fatal to the boy as to his mother, Lord John determined that the lad must go to Virginia, where Lord John's family has substantial property and determined to escort him there himself, seeing that the lad was greatly desolated by the loss of his mother. I expressed amazement as well as gratification that they should choose to make such alteration in their journey as required to visit this distant spot. But his lordship dismisses this, saying that he would have the boy see something of the different colonies, so as to appreciate the richness and variety of the land. The lad is most desirous of encountering red Indians, reminding me in this respect of Ian not so long ago. He is a comely lad, tall and well-formed for his years, which I believe are near twelve. He is somewhat subject still to melancholy from his mother's death, but is most pleasant in conversation and mannerly. For all, he is an earl. Lord John is his stepfather, I believe, his father having been Earl of Ellesmere. His name is William. Tuesday, 4 October the Indian in the corn crib died early this morning in spite of Claire's best efforts to save him. His face, body, and limbs were entirely suffused with a dreadful rash, giving him a most gruesome and mottled look. Claire thinks he suffered from the measles, and is much concerned, this being a vicious disease, plaguish, and quick to spread. She would not suffer anyone to go near the body save only for herself. She says she is safe from it by means of some charm. But we did all assemble near midday, whereat I read some scripture suitable to the occasion, and we said, a prayer, we said a prayer for the repose of his soul, for I trust that even unbaptized savages may find rest in God's mercy. We are in some doubt how this poor soul's earthly remains shall be disposed. I would, in common course, send Ian to summon his friends, that they might give him such burial as is common among the Indians. Clitter says we must not do this, however, for the corpse itself may spread the disease among the man's own people, a disaster which he would not choose to bring upon his friends. She advocates burying or burning the corpse ourselves, and yet I am reluctant to undertake such an action which might be easily misunderstood by the man's companions, they thinking that we sought by this means to hide some complicity in his death. I have said nothing of this concern to our guests. If danger seems imminent, I must send them away. Still, I am loath to part with their society so isolated in our situation. So isolated is our situation. For now we have laid the body in a small dry cave in the hill above the house, wherein I had thought to build a stable or storehouse. I ask your forgiveness for thus unburdening my mind at the cost of your own peace, I think all will be well in the end, but for the moment I confess to some worry. Should danger, either from the Indians or disease, seem to threaten, I will send this letter at once in the care of our guests, that I may be certain of reaching you. 
If all is well, I will write quickly to tell you. Your most loving brother, Jamie Fraser. There were still two more pages to go. By now it was mid-October. Jamie and Ian Wright. Jamie explains that they've been delivered and safe, but it's melancholy, and that Ian was sick with the measles, as was Lord John, but now they're both healthy and recovered. And young Ian writes a letter to his mother explaining how he was sick and now that his appetite is back and everything is well. He writes like the boy of his age. Brianna thought Lollybrock to be primitive, but the colonies were indeed a more wild and dangerous place. Ian takes Brianna on a tour of the farm and property. She sees all is in good condition and the animals healthy. It looks like a farm, even a modern one, except there's no equipment there. Ian was sporting his kilt to the surprise of Jenny and young Ian. In spite of that, she knew it wasn't usual for him to wear. Jenny's eyes had opened wide when he had come down to breakfast. Then she had bent her head, bearing a smile in her cup. Young Jamie had flicked a dark brow at his father, got back a bland look, and settled to a sausage with a faint shrug, and one of those small subterranean noises common to Scottish males. Brianna thinks about how the kilt, swords, pistols, and bagpipes were hidden away after Culloden. They were illegal. At first she thinks of the items as symbols of pride conquered, but that wasn't quite right. No, not quite conquered, she thought, with a queer small tug at her heart. She remembered Roger Wakefield squatting beside her under a gray sky on the battlefield at Culloden, his face lean and dark, eyes shadowed with knowledge of the dead nearby. Scots have long memories, and they're not the most forgiving of people. There's a clan stone out there with the name of Mackenzie's carved on it, and a good many of my relatives under it. I don't feel quite so personal about it as some, but I haven't forgotten either. No, not conquered, not through a thousand years of strife and treachery, and not now. Defeated, scattered, but still surviving, like Ian, maimed but upright, like her father, exiled, but still a Highlander. With an effort, she put Roger from her mind and hurried to keep up with Ian's long, limping stride. Ian was pleased Brianna asked to see the property. She'd be leaving in a week's time to board a ship to the colonies. She thought it was a beautiful place. And Brianna thinks she sees a cairn. Ah, no, lass. Those are the stones we turned up with the plow in the spring. Every year we take them out, and every year they come new ones. Damned if I can where they come from. Stone fairies come and sow them in the night, I expect. What will you plant here? Oh, it's planted already. This is the tatty field. The new vines will be up by the end of the month. Tatty? Oh, potatoes. Mama told me about that. Aye, it was Claire's notion and a good one, too. There's more than once the Tatis have kept us from starving. They walk a long way and up to the top of the hill. They can see the whole valley. Ian pulls out a stone bottle and remarks it was Claire's doing. He has teeth. A great one for eating weeds, your mother. But who's to argue, eh? Half the men my age are eating naught but porridge now. Claire left her mark on Lollybrach for sure. Ian thinks Claire knew what she was about, seeing how bra Brianna is. Ian wishes he could see Jamie's face when he meets Brianna. She is so much like him. Ian explains there wasn't much time during his last visit with Claire to Lollybrock to tell them about her, and there was a great moil. He lets her know why Jenny is anxious for her to leave. Your auntie's been troubled about that, thinking that you might blame her. Blame her for what? Brianna asks what Jenny had to do with Leary. Girl, your hair is going to curl when you hear what she had to do with it. Ian is surprised at how much knowledge Brianna has of Jamie's history. 
He goes on to explain Jamie's countenance when he returned from England after being in Ardsmere, and the contrast to him after Culloden. It was like talking to a ghost. He would look at me and smile and answer, but he was not really there. Before, after Culloden, it was different then. He was sore wounded, and he'd lost Claire. They climbed up to where Jamie had lived as Dunbonnet. Brianna entered the cave and immediately felt entombed. She had no idea how Jamie lived there for seven years, but thinks maybe she could do it if she had to. She was a Fraser after all. She sat outside the cave, becoming part of the nature surrounding it. This is something her mother and father do. She connects to it and thinks she understands why Jamie could tolerate his time in the cave. One word explained it. Solitude, not loneliness, but solitude. Not suffering, but endurance. The discovery of grim kinship with the rocks and sky, and the finding here of a harsh peace that would transcend bodily discomfort, a healing instead of the wounds of the soul. He had perhaps found the cave not a tomb, but a refuge drawn strength from its rocks, like Antaeus thrown to earth, for this place was part of him. Who had been born here, as it was part of her, who had never seen it before. She gets it. She leaves a small memory offering before heading down to Ian. Ian had explained to her about Jamie living in the cave and about being hard to kill, <laughs> stubborn as a rock, as a Fraser rock. <laughs> I'm glad to see Brianna so thoughtful here. Where she's sitting with it, and she's trying to figure out where she fits in the space, what she is to it, and what it is to her. She asks Ian about the legality of wearing his kilt. He explains soldiers hadn't come in a long time; there was nothing left of value to them; only the land was left. Ian asks Brianna to save a question, answered by Jamie when she finds him. Do about what? About Lolly Brach. You'll maybe know, maybe not, that your father made a deed of sassin before Culloden to give over the place to young Jamie. Should it all come to smash and he be killed or condemned as a traitor? But that would be before you were born, before he kent that he'd have a bairn of his own. Yes, I did know that. I didn't come for that, Uncle. Lallybrach isn't mine, and I don't want it. All I want is to see my father and my mother. Brianna assures him Jamie wouldn't want to change who has Lallybrach, and Brianna doesn't want it. Ian thinks she knows an awful lot about what Jamie will do, even though she hasn't met him. But of course, Claire would have told her all about Jamie. Aye, your mother will have told you, I suppose. And she did know him, for all she was a Sassenach, but then she was always special. Your mother. <laughs> yes, Claire is special indeed. Brianna asks about something Leary said. She had used the word fetch when she was going on about Brianna's mother, Claire interfering with her marriage to Jamie. A fetch is the sight of a person when the person himself is far away. Sometimes it will be a person that died far from home. It's ill luck to see one, but worse luck to meet your own. For if you do, you die. It was the absolute matter of factness of his tone that made a shiver run down her spine. I hope I don't. But she said, "Lear." She stumbled on the name, Liri. I well, it was at her wedding to Jamie that Jenny saw your mother's fetch. That's true. She kent then that it was a bad match, but it was too late to be undone. Yep,、yeah. Jenny's got a bit of the sight. I wonder if that has to do with Jamie's astral projection travel thing that he does. Getting back to why Jamie married Leary, Ian tells her Jamie was like a ghost with no spark in him. 
After Culloden, he was bad hurt. But there was fighting still to do of a kind, and that kept him alive. When he came home from England, there was not anything here for him, really. So Jenny made the match for him with Larry. You'll maybe be old enough to know, for all you're unwed yet, what a woman can do for a man, or he for her, I suppose, to heal him, I mean, fill his emptiness. He touched his maimed leg absently. Jamie would leery from pity, I think. And if she had truly needed him, I well. He shrugged again and smiled at her. It's no use to say what might have been or should be, is it? But he had left Leary's house some time before your mother came back. You should know that. Brianna felt a small surge of relief. Oh, I'm glad to know that. And my mother, when she came back? He was very glad to see her. Ian said simply, This time the smile lighted his whole face like sunshine. So was I. That was pretty amazing for Ian to share all of that with Brianna. And I think there's so much to unpack in this chapter. First, Jamie has a child and his family's shocked. Second, the Leary incident. That poor woman. Sometimes it's difficult not to feel sorry for her. She loved her daughters more than anything. I think she was a good mother. I think she didn't really know how to love someone, how to be a wife, how to have someone need you in a way that's primal. I think Jamie Fraser would be easy to love if you were healthy. <laughs> he would be a wonderful partner, and he wants what's best for who he's with, and he wants to give joy and receive joy. She didn't know how to do that. I think there was a lot of damage done to Leary by somebody, and we've talked about that before. But I do think she's also exceedingly immature, like old Alec had said she would be. Third, the worry over Jamie wanting Brianna to have the property. Four, Brianna finding her connection and realizing she's no longer alone. She has a huge family. Five, the letter from the ridge and the realization it is a dangerous and precarious place you'll be going to. Six, Jamie and Claire are together and happy. Seven, Jenny has guilt. And she's terrible at direct communication when it counts. Thankfully, Ian is excellent at deciphering and communicating what is necessary. 8. Jenny Murray is a sensitive person underneath her steel. 9. Brianna has come into her own as a woman. She has matured and has the combined strength of her mother and her father's, plural, both her father's. There are so many literary elements at play, an excellent depth of character development, as we see through Brianna's eyes the family she's only heard of. And her realizing her mother did an excellent job in relaying who they are. I think Claire prepared Brianna extraordinarily well without meaning to for her journey back in time. We cannot forget about Frank being an expert on this time in history, Brianna certainly would have read his works. Whoa, this was big. So my favorite part is Brianna totally letting the cat out of the bag and calling Leary a fucking murderess and <laughs> disclosing for the first time to Jenny and Ian and anybody else who was listening what Leary did at Crane's Mirror. I mean, that was just brilliant. And the fact that Brianna was able to keep her temper for the most part. Yep, the girl has learned well. She's growing. Yay, Brianna! This is about the point in the books when I first read them that I really began to like Brianna, Ellen, Randall Fraser. This is where 
I stopped seeing her as being bratty and selfish and not paying attention to what was around her. This is the pivotal time for me where I began to appreciate her for who she is and where her character is going. Like, I wanted to know more. Do you feel the same way? I mean, what comments and thoughts came up for you as I went through the podcast? It's one chapter, and now we're sitting at an hour-ish. That's a lot. And we haven't seen her for, what, a year and a half, and this is the first kind of first person time that we've seen her, her point of view. So we really don't know, except for what Roger has told us, what she was up to. Clearly, she was up to many more things than we had any idea for. (laughs) Uh, Next podcast is chapters 35 and 36. I'm going to first read some emails. Like always, I love getting weekly emails. Call and leave messages on the voice line too, 719-425-9444. And I'll put them on the podcast. I'll clip them in. Otherwise, I'll read it. And in the show notes, or rather my script, are links to a few things of interest. In the beginning, about the General Wade's military roads, red deer track trails, what is a kale yard, the whole history of tomatoes, tomatoes being bad for us and poisonous. They got put into the deadly nightshade family without good reason. But they're still considered nightshades, just like bell peppers. But I eat them almost every day, as well as bell peppers and other nightshades. Hmm. <laughs> Makes me feel like a superhero when I realize that other people used to be scared to eat them. So the first email is from Jan. And she says, D, four items. One, as Mr. Rogers used to say, just by being you, you'll be a major success at the Denver Comic Con. Thank you, Jan. Number two, big, no, giant congratulations on the start of year five. Yep, yesterday, April 20th, is the fourth anniversary of a dram of Outlander. I'm super excited. There must be days when it seems a bit burdensome, but hopefully knowing how many of us enjoy, anticipate, and respect your work, those days will be few and far between. It's part of my weekly schedule now. If I don't produce the podcast, it would feel really strange. I... Just have it scheduled in with school and family and work. The only thing I can't work around is when babies decide to show up. (laughs) That I have zero control over. (laughs) Three, podcast number 131. It just hit me that Jillian Galis actually had known of Claire's disappearance in the 1940s because she had written about it in her grimoire. It's interesting that she didn't realize who Claire was earlier in Outlander. I think she was trying to figure out if it was actually her because she didn't meet her. It was only from newspaper articles that she knew about the incident. Number four, in this podcast, you say we are almost halfway through drums. It's funny that when I think of Drums of Autumn, I think of it mainly as the Brianna Roger traveling back in time show and the journey they take before they are reunited. But we haven't even gotten to that. (laughs) I didn't forget the major events before, but in my memory, all of that served as a prelude to the story. Drums is kind of part one, establishing Fraser's Ridge, and part two, the story of Roger and Brianna's relationship. Of course, you have to intertwine duplicitous Jocasta, comical John Q., Myers, loyal Lord John, and that dastardly Stephen B. into both parts. Well, as we know... Things are about to ratchet up. (laughs) Smiley face. Again, congratulations on your perseverance and well-deserved recognition. Yay, Desiree. Best, Jan. (laughs) Thank you, Jan. I hope I did your email justice in the reading. (laughs) 
And Meredith sent a short but sweet email this week from Everett, Washington. I very much like the chapters in which Brianna meets her long lost family. If they could fit it all in, I would love it if the writer showed Jamie's reunion with William and John Gray in the same episode. I would really love that. What do you think? Hmm. Because he wrote that lengthy letter, I guess we could see parts of it as flashback with the reading of the letter. But I think they're really two separate events, especially because they happened so far apart. I mean, they're 10 months difference where all those events happened on Fraser's Ridge the prior year, 1768, and when Brianna is at Lollybrach. So... Thank you all, and I appreciate you so very much. And you can find A Dram of Outlander on Facebook. There's a large Facebook page, A Dram of Outlander. And then there's the A Dram of Outlander group. You have to ask to join. It is closed, and you have to answer three simple questions. Again, so I know you're not a troll or a dreaded bot. I mean, it's a good community, and I really don't want the trolls or the bots with us. And I just want to give you all a shout out again because you are so amazing. It is a rarity I ever have to moderate. With the amount of people on the page and in the group, I should have to moderate more simply by statistics, <laughs> but I don't because you're all awesome grown ups and you're super smart. <laughs> And you're respectful, and you appreciate the differences other people bring to the Outlander table, which I like. So the difference between the page and the group is the page is primarily me posting, you responding, and the group is really for you. You don't have to only talk about Outlander. You can talk about related things or things of interest. You just can't talk politics unless it's about Jacobite politics, and we're talking about the stories and history, and you can't sell stuff. It's pretty simple. <laughs> be nice. Be kind. Be thoughtful. But it's really about you interacting with each other and being able to post things you find interesting. So go there. Um, A Dram of Outlander is also on Twitter and Instagram under Dram of Outlander. And if you're ever looking for tweets that... I may send. You can look under the Twitter handle or hashtag ADOO. Again, for a drama of Outlander. Yes, I know. I'm super creative, right? <laughs> and the website is adramaoutlander.com. If you would like to send an email like Jan and Meredith, you can send it to contact at adramaoutlander.com. And again, the voice line is 719 719- Four two five nine four four four, And lastly, how do you support the podcast? Well, by sharing the podcast, going on to the social media pages and sites and interacting, sharing information, telling people about it, getting your friends to join and talk about their love of Outlander too. We are really a big community in this world that love Outlander. There's like 25, 28 million Outlander readers. And... That means there's a lot of us <laughs> and all our perspectives make it go round, right? It's truly fascinating. You can go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for me on iTunes. Every review helps, especially every five-star review <laughs> helps people find me. And frankly, I Sometimes people go to the Facebook page or to Apple Podcasts and iTunes, and they leave bogus, low reviews. I don't know what their motivation is, but I do have some for no reason. And I don't even know why those are there. There's no explanation. There's nothing. I think it's a way just to be mean, frankly. I don't know why anybody would take the time, but considering the amount of really positive reviews on the page and on Apple Podcasts, I have no idea why somebody would do that, but they're there sometimes. You can also go through Spotify 
Stitcher, Google Play, and a variety of other streaming sites. But please share it. Let people know about it. It's fabulous. And I know I've been telling you about a contest for a few weeks. I haven't been able to get all this stuff together. I have this beautiful necklace and earrings made by an Outlander peer, Erin. She makes them and it's her with a friend and it's her own business. And it's so beautiful. I promised to get up this week in honor of my four years of a dream of Outlander. And so you could win it and it's global. Okay. So I appreciate you so much. And I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And we're going until the end of August together, but it's already April. <laughs> so we're what four, basically four months in already. All right. So thank you so much for listening. And I hope you have a fantastic and blessed week. Slange va.